Well, hello, almost good afternoon, um, still good morning. Um, and I think there's folks online too, so hello to those folks. Um, thank you for coming to our forum uh, this month. And you can see our topic is Facing Myths That Dehumanize the Other by Iris Kelts. And I would like to introduce Iris here. So Iris Kelts is an award-winning freelance journalist and author of two historical memoirs. Her articles, essays, and op-eds have appeared in national print and electronic media. She has spoken in community centers, churches, synagogues, universities, book clubs, and more. Unexpected Bride in the Promised Land, Journeys in Palestine and Israel, this book right here, has won four awards, including first place for memoir from the National Federation of Press Women. In 1967, Celts married into a Palestinian family within weeks of her arrival in East Jerusalem, then governed by Jordan. Personal stories laden with historical information offer invaluable insights into the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian tragedy that has global repercussions. So let's warmly welcome Iris for being here today. Thank you so much. And we'll have a Q&A after, so thanks. Well, thank you for inviting me into your community for this very, very important conversation. Uh, what Tina didn't mention is my other book is called Scrapbook of a Taos Hippie, which documents the counterculture in northern New Mexico. I tell people I've written two books. One is we're all one tribe, but we love each other. And the other is we're all one tribe, but we hate each other. So I'm here to tell you why we're really, we're all one tribe, and we should all love each other book. And thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. This uh, topic never, ever leaves my mind and my heart. Ever since I stumbled into it as a very young person. And I'm just going to start there. But I'd like to start with a song. But don't worry, I'm not going to sing. I'm going to recite it. It's one of my favorite songs. You might know it. It's from South Pacific. And I think it's the best anti-racist song that was ever written. Some of you might know it. And if you sing better than me, sing. I'm just going to recite the words. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. And that's from South Pacific. Some of you might know that song. Now, it's unlikely that I would have ended up in the Six-Day War, 1967, finding sanctuary with a Palestinian family in East Jerusalem. Now, the likelihood of that was just about zero. I was on my way to go live on a kibbutz. After all, I'm Jewish, and I figured, well, they'll take me in. So I entered Jerusalem very innocent, very innocent, not even knowing that Jerusalem was a divided city. Because when I first entered Jerusalem, it was divided between East Jerusalem, which was ruled by Jordan, and West Jerusalem, which was Israel. And in between East and West Jerusalem, oh, good, you have the maps up. That helps. Yeah, and, and the four maps. Oh, good. Uh, was a swath of land they called no man's land, for good reason. If you went in there, you'd be shot at either side. And the only safe 
passage to get through no man's land was with a United Nations convoy that didn't run regularly, so I had to wait in East Jerusalem, Jordan, to go through with, with the convoy to make it safely over to West Jerusalem, Israel, a delay long enough which set my life on a totally different course because waiting, that's when I met the uh, Palestinian family who were living in East Jerusalem. But, you know, I think it's important to take a step back and consider how long Jerusalem has been occupied or lived in. And I couldn't even memorize this. I got this from a history book. It's amazing, all the conquerors that have been in Jerusalem. I entered Jerusalem not knowing it was a divided city. The uh, Jews call it Yerushalayim. That's what it was called when I was growing up. And then I learned its other name from the Palestinians, which was El Quds. El Quds means the sacred, which is very similar to the Hebrew word kadosh, which means sacred. Because Arabic and Hebrew, there's so many similarities that I was able to learn Arabic more quickly because I did know some Hebrew. Jerusalem started as a Canaanite city-state in the Bronze Age 4,000 years ago. It has known a succession of conquerors and rulers, from Solomon, king of Judah, the Babylonians, the Macedonians, the Egyptians, the Seleucids, the Greeks, the Jewish Hasmoneans, the Romans, Byzantines, Persians, Umayyads, Abbasids, Fatimids, Ayyubids, Crusaders, Mamelukes, Ottoman Turks, British, Jordanians, and now the Israelis. And so you could see that there is a long succession of people who have claimed Jerusalem as theirs. And I walked into Jerusalem's history just at the tail end of the Jordanian rule. But you know, in uh, studying some of the history, I was really shocked to find to discover that the Ottoman Turks ruled oh, in that area, ruled Palestine, the, the four maps, um, for over 400 years. Over 400 years. I'd completely forgotten about them because in, in uh, my area of history, in Hebrew school, they just focused on when the British declared the Balfour Declaration and the British only ruled there for 22 years. And so it's really interesting that we're not focused more on the over 400 years that the, um, that the Ottoman Turks ruled there. And of course, you probably know that the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians are known as the people of the book. So I have brought my books with me. And this book, which I highly recommend, is called Jerusalem 1913. And it shows the picture of what Jerusalem was like at the very tail end of the Ottoman Empire, just as the, before the British took it over, and what life was like. And one of the uh, big takeaways for me, and I, I love this book, it's short, it's well written, and it's got beautiful historical pictures in it, was that the people, the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims during the Ottoman Empire, they identify themselves as, I'm Jewish, subject of the Ottomans. I'm Muslim, subject of the Ottomans. I'm Christian, subject of the Ottomans. And with that context, there was no such thing as Jew versus Arab at all. That paradigm did not exist. They lived as neighbors. They celebrated holidays together. They did business together. Um, what we would call a fairly normal life. And so it's really good to step back from what's happening right now in the world and take a little broader historical view. And this book really gives you that. This is the tail end of the Ottoman Empire. Well, I walked into Jerusalem not only as a very, very young, innocent woman, but I was carrying a lot of baggage, not just my backpack. The baggage that I had learned in childhood. I did attend Hebrew school. I was bat mitzvahed. 
uh, my mother was very religious, and Israel was always very important to our family. But here's some of the things that I entered Jerusalem with that I believed growing up. Some of the myths I grew up with. The Arabs hate us, and they want to drive us into the sea. Jews and Muslims are natural-born enemies. God promised Canaan to Abraham's descendants. This was a land without a people for a people without a land. Now, that was a movement to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine, which was really interesting. An empty land? Really? Because when I was a kid, one of the things that we had to do was we were given these uh, little blue tin cans, and we ran around the neighborhood collecting money, and I was one of them, to plant a tree in Israel. And I did that. And that comes from Deuteronomy. When you come to the land, you shall plant trees. So Jews are admonished to plant trees in Israel. Now, the Jewish National Fund has planted over 240 million trees. They've built over 180 dams and reservoirs, and they've created over 1,000 national parks that are held in trust for Jewish people. Now, Arab Israelis are prohibited from living on this land. And as a child, like I said, I participated in planting and raising money to plant those trees. But then when I went back to Israel many, many years later, this is after the war, I met a group of people, Jewish Israelis, called Zochrot. Zochrot is the Hebrew word meaning we remember, we remember. And Zochrot took us into one of the national parks called uh, Canada Park. And if I had just walked into Canada Park by myself, I would not have known this. But what it is is the, uh, they planted fast-growing pine trees and eucalyptus trees in these parks as opposed to the indigenous trees. And so Zoch wrote, takes you and shows you where there had been a Palestinian village that's covered over by these fast-growing trees. And this group, Zoch wrote, I think I have a, it's okay, I, I'll just, um, yeah, there, that's, that's the sign. They, they put signs up everywhere where there had been a Palestinian village in the park just to mark it. We remember, we will not forget, this was a Palestinian village that is covered over and buried in the heart of the, of a, the national park but it existed, and you could see the foundations of some of the buildings, including uh, the prayer place and some of the, uh, the foundations of other buildings there. You could see them, and the trees that grew there were different. You could see there were some almond trees and uh, olive trees scattered in, but I would have easily missed this were I not uh, being guided by Zuck wrote when I went there. Yeah, go back to the, uh, the four maps. Now, this is just a little bit of history. These, these four maps, whoever put them together, it's just a brilliant tool for learning um, history. The first map is what we call historic Palestine. And Palestine, uh, it, it's even in the Bible, Jesus was from Palestine. And all of that green was historic Palestine. Then when the British took it over, it was called Mandate Palestine because it became their mandate. But when the Ottomans were there, it was just part of the Ottoman Empire. And the next picture is interesting. That's when uh, the United Nations decided, the, I mean, the British, uh, created the Balfour Declaration, and Palestine was divided into these four sections. The green area, which you can see, includes uh, what's now we call the Gaza Strip. And then the other area, which is close to what we now consider the West Bank, but not quite. 
So the Jews coming from Europe, and I want to just add one thing. There were Jews living in Palestine before all the immigration from Europe, and the Holocaust was a great impetus in a lot of the Jewish immigration to Palestine. As a matter of fact, I was the first person in my family to meet uh, our cousin Meyer, who was a survivor of the Holocaust. I was the first person in my family to meet him, much to his shock, because when I came to meet him, I had a Palestinian husband in tow. So, But fortunately, we had no language in common, so we couldn't fight. Uh, my cousin Meyer, he spoke um, Hebrew and Yiddish, and I spoke English, of course, and I had studied some French, so I spoke some French. And my uh, Palestinian husband, he knew Arabic and uh, broken English and some Arabic languages. So we had a lovely afternoon together, not worrying a whole lot about talking about particulars. I remember he took us to the zoo in Tel Aviv, and he took us out to lunch. And I kept thinking, wonder what he thinks about my Palestinian husband. But uh, I didn't find that out until years later. So um, the Jews were given 55% of historic Palestine. And the Palestinians were given 45%. And there's a lot of stories you'll say, well, they turned it down. They turned it down. Well, if somebody came into this room and divided it into quadrants and cut it and said, well, you only have this section over here as yours, you might say, well, I don't think so. I don't think so. This is one room. Let's, let's keep it together. I don't want to divide it up. And the Palestinians, and I'm going to get into the meaning of those words in just a few minutes because... Uh, I think those words are used very carelessly sometimes, or unclear about what their meanings are, is a better way to put it. So that's the second picture, and that's what the Balfour Declaration was declaring, and the United Nations, the UN Partition Plan in 1947, that the Palestinians said no. And in truth, when you read that book about um, Jerusalem 1913, you'll find out that a lot of the Jews who were already living in Jerusalem were not in favor of dividing it up. There was a lot of division and different opinions within the Jewish yeshuv or community, which was what it was called. And so when they said no, there was a war. And I'm not going to go into the particulars of who was stronger and who was the victims and who was the most powerful, but the upshot of that war was that Israel was created on 78% of what was historic Palestine. And the green area that you see now that we, that's called the Gaza Strip was ruled by Egypt. And the West Bank, because it's the West Bank of the Jordan River, was ruled by Jordan. And Jerusalem is like right on the edge of, uh, it's not marked there, but it's, it's kind of right in between. Uh, and it's called the Green Line. That boundary there, that was an international uh, agreed upon boundary. That's the official map of Israel. And so sometimes uh, people will say Israel proper, and that's what that means. Israel proper would be 78% of what was historic Palestine because that was an agreed upon international boundary. And the green line was what separated the West Bank from Israel proper. Now, I walked in there, and honestly, I did not know all this history. They did not teach all this to me in Hebrew school. I'm going to go back and complain someday. But I walked in carrying all of these preconceived feelings about the Arabs. And my first day I was there, there was a youth hostel that was right on the border of the Green Line and 
right on the edge of no man's land. And I could look over and see Israel, the lights of the electric lights twinkling in Israel from the youth hostel. I couldn't wait to get there. But I had to wait to get my visa. So while I was waiting, I thought, well, I, I might as well go into the old city. Why not? Here I am. That's, that's how much, that's how innocent I was. I was not on a religious pilgrimage. I couldn't wait to go to the kibbutz and help harvest oranges. I was going to meet a friend there and meet other young people, which probably is why I ended up in New Mexico on a commune. I always had that inclination. Um, and then I met a Palestinian family on my first day venturing into the old city. And they welcomed me. It was, the welcome was amazing, so warm and wonderful. And then when they found out I was Jewish, I, I didn't keep it a secret. Yeah, I'm Jewish and proud of it. They were like, okay, you're Jewish. We're going to take you to the Wailing Wall. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's one of my childhood myths gone. They insisted on taking me to the Wailing Wall. What's interesting about the Wailing Wall then, and I didn't realize how special it was, was the Wailing Wall was embedded into an ancient quarter called the Maghreb Quarter, the Moroccan Quarter, which was later destroyed during the Six-Day War to create that open-air synagogue that you all see. And so when I went back 32 years later, I, I didn't recognize the Wailing Wall because when I first saw it, it was just like uh, just part of this neighborhood and it had like a very broad like alleyway or street and Jews used to go there and pray but it was it was not the impressive open air synagogue that you see today. So I did go to the Wailing Wall and my Palestinian friends in insisted that I lean my head against them and say a prayer, which I did. And when I met them, one of the first things they told me was that they were uh, the big bad Palestinians, they said. And you know what's amazing is I'd never heard that word growing up. Never. Because in my growing up, they were always called those Arabs who hate us and want to drive us into the sea. So when I met the Palestinians, I thought, wow, that's an interesting new tribe. I should get to know these people. wonder who they are. Maybe if I had known that word, maybe I would have been afraid, but I had never heard that word. They were just those Arabs. And now I met the Palestinians not having any idea that they were the official enemy of our people. But since I didn't know, I, they welcomed me, and I was so happy to be welcomed. It was just wonderful, and I just loved living with them. And it's really amazing, but I was so at home, I ended up marrying into their family within two or three weeks of arriving there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the cover of the book. That is a picture of me right after we got married in the court in um, East Jerusalem. And I am the one standing with the striped dress with a little bit of attitude. You know, I hope I'm still recognizable. And so that was my uh, Palestinian husband, whose name was Faisal. On the other side of him is his father. And the man on the other side wearing a kafia, he was the court translator because they wanted to make sure that, um, you know, I knew what was happening. It was clear. So he, he was fluent in English and Arabic. So he was the translator, and he translated to me. That picture was taken on May 22nd, 1967, and the war broke out on June 5th, 1967. So when the war broke out, we were planning our honeymoon, which was going to be to a place called Petra. Some of you may have heard it. Maybe you've been lucky enough to be there. It's one of the most amazing places on planet Earth. And I was so excited to take a trip there. But after the war, after the war, Petra and everything was on the other side of the boundary. So I always say I never went to Israel. Israel came to me. But there's a moment 
And it's what I start my book with, which is the very first interface between my Palestinian family and the Israeli soldiers after they conquered Jerusalem. Now, you know, the war was very short. Really, they call it the Six-Day War. And I found out why in doing some research. They call it the Six-Day War. You know, wars have poetic names, and people really spend a lot of time naming wars. And this was called the Six-Day War after Genesis. And the world was created in six days, and on the seventh day, God rested. But in truth, they, the Israelis won the war in a couple of hours after they took out the Egyptian Air Force that was sitting on tarmacs without any protection. They were gone, and that was the mo would have been the most formidable opposition. So it was a short war, and uh, I hid with the Palestinian family, and we hid in, um, in Ramallah, and for, for days, it's, it's, time was hard to tell you. It didn't, six days, three hours, it was just, when the bombs were coming, it was a different sensation of the bombs dropping on your head. Luckily, the building that we were in did not get hit, but when we ended up going to the street, we could see that buildings all around us had been hit because they were missing huge chunks of the stone. So all of a sudden, we heard human sounds in the street. And my friend said, oh my god, they heard Hebrew. Now Hebrew was familiar to me. I grew up studying it. I went to Hebrew school. But they were terrified of the Israeli soldiers, terrified. So they turned to me and they said, when those Israeli soldiers come in here and they were entering every house, into every single house, there'd be a cadre of soldiers entering. You need to tell them, you're Jewish, you're American, and we're friends. And I'm like, okay. Well, I looked at my friends and I thought, you know, I did not physically look terribly different from them. And the only way that I could really prove that, no, I'm Jewish, I'm from New York, was with my voice. Because as soon as I open my mouth, they're going to say, She's Jewish. She's from New York. But, you know, I could have been killed before then, before I had a chance to open my mouth. But they gave me the mission of my life, and which is why I'm here today. You tell them you're Jewish, you're American, and we're friends. And I got that mission at a young age. And I will continue to carry that message for the rest of my life. And I know we're in a very dire, very difficult moment in the history of the world right now. And I will always carry that moment no matter how hopeless I feel inside. Now, I'm Jewish. I claim it. I own it. I grew up that way. But you know, Israel is a Jewish state. It claims to be a state for the Jews. And I think it's very important to like try to think of what does that word Jewish mean? And I have spent since then trying to figure out wh what does the word Jewish mean? I've really ruminated on that thought. What does Jewish mean? Are you Jewish because your mother's Jewish? Are you Jewish because your father's Jewish? Are you Jewish because you converted? Was the rabbi kosher enough? Because some rabbis, if you were converted by that rabbi, they wouldn't even count it. Is it because you don't eat pork? Hmm. Are you a self-proclaimed Jew? Now, Judaism is the oldest of the Abrahamic religions, and it started in the Bronze Age, like Jerusalem, about 4,000 years ago. And what was interesting is I was taught in Hebrew school that Abraham was the first Jew. And then I sat down with a Muslim one day, and he said, no, no, he wasn't the first Jew. I said, yes, he was. They told me that in Hebrew school. He said, no, he was the first monotheist, which is why the, he is also the patriarchs to Muslims. So really, at the very least, Muslims and Jews are, are cousins. So they call him Ibrahim, 
which was the name of Faisal's father. His name was Ibrahim. And if I had had a son, his name would have been Ibrahim. So Abraham is the common patriarch. You know, another really interesting thing I discovered, you know, you all know the story of how Abraham almost sacrificed his son. Everybody knows that story, right? Well, so I grew up with that story, and it's, it's a rough story of father almost sacrificing his son. That's a tough story. But what's interesting is the same story, the same story is in the Quran. Only the son that's almost sacrificed is the other son. It wasn't Isaac. It was his brother. Ishmael was the one who's almost sacrificed. So both Muslims and Jews claim lineage to the son who's almost sacrificed. Now, that, that gave me some pause for thought. And then when you look at Jews, Jews come in all colors, shapes, sizes, and opinions. There are the Mizrahi Jews that come from North Africa. Mizrahi Jews, also known as the, the Arab Jews. And what's interesting is my mother's maiden name is Saif, which is an Arabic word, and it means sword. And um, someday I'm going to comb the mysteries of 23andMe to see if I have some Mizrahi blood in my lineage, because as far as I know, I'm from the lineage called Ashkenazi Jew, which is Central uh, Europe and Ukraine. My father's side is Ukrainian, and my mother's side is Austria-Hungary. And then there are the Sephardic Jews from Spain, Sepharad in Hebrew, and their language was Ladino. The mother tongue of the Mizrahi Jews was Arabic, and the Sephardic Jews, Ladino. And both the Sephardic and the Mizrahi Jews lived under Muslim rule for thousands of years, a very long time ago. And like I said, I'm from the Ashkenazi Jews, and I understood uh, my grandparents' secret language of Yiddish because they spoke Yiddish when they didn't want me to understand what they were saying, which was how I picked it up. I'm not fluent in it, but I can understand a lot of it. Now, the only group of people who seem to have a clear picture, and, and I want to say, you know, my son married a woman who is not Jewish, and some people would say, oh, well, your granddaughters aren't Jewish, and I'm like, Oh, well, I think they are. Who are you to say they're not? And I went once one to a, a conference, and there were the, all these like experts in the field, and I asked them, well, what do you think is the meaning of the word Jewish? And they said, simply, if you self-identify as a Jew, well, you're a Jew. And I'm like, okay, well, that's simple enough. But then I did a little bit of research because I am a child who... Ex read, grew up on Holocaust books, and like I said, I met someone in my family who was a Holocaust survivor when I went there. The only group who seems to have a very clear idea of how to define the word Jewish were the Nazis, and this is what they said. Jews belong to a distinct and inferior race. Intermarriages and sexual relations between Jews and Germans were banned. In the Nuremberg Laws, a person with three or four Jewish grandparents is a Jew. A grandparent is Jewish if they belong to the Jewish religious community. So there were a lot of Jewish socialists who did not belong, go to synagogue and stuff. They carried out their activism in a different way. Bernie Sanders, no names mentioned. Um, so even that was unclear. What is a Jew? If you're a Jewish state, what is a Jew? And then I had to look up the word, well, what is an Arab? And that was also interesting. An Arab was a linguistic family. That's what it was. If your mother tongue was Arab was if your mother tongue was Arabic, you're you're an Arab. And that's why all the Jews that come from North Africa are Arab Jews, but in Israel they're known as Mizrahi Jews, which means from the East, because in Israel Arab is tends to be a derogatory term. So they call them Mizrahi. 
Now, I have a friend, and this is really true. You can't make this up. His name is Micha, and his family emigrated from Central uh, Europe to Palestine before the creation of Israel. So they moved there. But my friend was born in Palestine, which makes him a Jewish Palestinian. Those are two words you don't often see together. Then Israel was created in 48. So then he became a Jewish Palestinian Israeli. Then he moved to the States, and he became a Jewish Palestinian Israeli American. And here's the punchline. Then he converted and became a Muslim. And then he became a Jewish, Palestinian, Israeli, American, Muslim, and he built a beautiful mosque in his backyard. Really, this is true, in Taos. You can't make this up. But it really helps me to explain what those words mean when I use my friend Micha as, as an example. And uh, Micha, by the way, was one of the first Israeli soldiers uh, in the Six-Day War. That's how we met, to conquer Jerusalem. We met, we were both teachers in the same school in uh, Taos, and we discovered that we were both in the Six-Day War. And what's interesting is, when I walk through the streets of the old city of Jerusalem, if I wore more traditional clothes, the Israeli soldiers, I was invisible. I was invisible. And if, but if I, if I dressed in like modern clothes, I took out my old jeans and t-shirts, shalom, shalom, they recognize me. This is the same person, just the clothes changed if I was invisible or if I was recognized and greeted. Now, I just really want to make it clear. Judaism is thousands and thousands of years old. It was the original of the Abrahamic religions. I hold fast to my Judaism. I love celebrating Shabbat on Friday night and breaking bread with friends. Zionism is not Judaism. Zionism is a little over 100 years old. Judaism is thousands of years old. They are not the same thing. And I've worked hard to divorce them. But they're still, it's, it's, they're conflated all the time. And the definition of Zionism is it's a European political ideology that sought to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And even within that, saying that, there are different kinds of Zionists. Some were cultural Zionists, which meant they didn't feel the need for a nation state. They wanted a sanctuary where Jewish culture could flower and happen, but they didn't need it to be a nation state. And anti-Semitism. I have certainly experienced that in my life. As a matter of fact, I grew up in a neighborhood where we were the only Jewish family, and I remember when the kids in the neighborhood came over one day and said, accused me and my two brothers of killing God. And I had to go home to my mother and say, what? What? They said we, we killed God? And so anti-Semitism was started in the 19th century, and it means hatred of Jews. But in addition to that, Jews were also associated, and this is also associated with anti-Semitism, constitutional democracy, free trade, socialism, pacifism, equal civil rights. And that definition it comes from the Holocaust Memorial Museum. I, I just want you to know that. And there's a new definition floating now called the IRA, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and it started in 2016. It's known as IRA. And it conflates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. Now, those of us who are my age, we know that you can be critical of your country and not hate your country. I was at the barricades working to stop the Vietnam War. Didn't mean I'm anti-American or hate my country. As a matter of fact, I think if you love Israel, you would be critical of the actions of that government now. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. 
and they're a little bit out of control, in my opinion. And I've been going to, a, again, I'm like, I'm getting a little old for being at the barricades. I've been at the barricades for a long time, getting a little old, ready to pass the torch, but I'm still there. And one of the rally cries has really seemed to caught the ear of the whole world. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And a lot of Jews say it's erasing Israel. But to Palestinians, it's not erasing Israel at all. It means freedom and equality for all the people who live between the river and the sea. We'll all be free. Israel and all the Jews who live there won't be free until everybody is free. And the one thing about Israel that is so beautiful is that Israel is a multicultural, multi-religious country. That's what it is. It doesn't have to try to get that way. It is a multicultural country. And when I was there, right after the Six-Day War, the borders were open. And I did cross through no man's land without the United Nations uh, accompanying me. We were just, it was just an open border. And one of the things is I, I walked through there and my Palestinian husband, his grandfather's house had been in that swath of land that had been left vacant for 19 years. Israel was 19 years at the time. It was just a baby. And he found the house. He found it. We went inside. His grandfather had been a very well-known sheikh. We found his correspondence. We found a 100-year-old handwritten Quran. It was amazing. That house was so beautiful. I could have imagined living in it the rest of my life. I loved it. We went home to tell the rest of the family about the house, and we made a picnic the next day. We were going to come back and just sit. It was so cool in the house because it was stone, and it was like adobe. It was like very cool in the summer, even though no matter how hot it was outside. We came back the next day. The house had been bulldozed, gone. And the whole area, it, was, it had been uh, an old Palestinian village, gone, bulldozed. You couldn't, even the fig tree that had been fruit bearing, because we ate figs off it the day before, bulldozed which really shocked me because I'm like, wait a minute. I helped plant all those trees. Why would they bulldoze a fruit-giving fig tree? But, but they did. And it was very, very sad for the whole family. The other thing I have to say is after the war, one of the things I heard very common in the Palestinian community where I lived is, we're home. We're home. They had been separated. That map, it's okay, it's okay. From family, because they had been in Jordan and they couldn't cross the border to get into Israel proper, so they couldn't see family. I witnessed a reunion by relatives who'd been living in Beersheba who crossed over, just like perfectly normal thing to do, get on a bus and go over and visit their family in East Jerusalem. For the first time in 19 years, it was such a heartfelt reunion. They just sat on the stone floor of the outside patio drinking tea and hugging and talking Arabic. I had no idea what they were saying, but they were so happy to be together. That was clear. And one thing I can say is in 1967, Israel lost an opportunity. In 1948, they committed the creation of the independent state of Israel, which my family celebrated, created a Nakba for the Palestinians. 750 people into forced expulsion, over 500 Palestinian villages destroyed. Like I said, some hidden in the national forest, buried there. But in, after the Six-Day War, the Palestinians I do believe this, and I could say I was living in the heart of the Palestinian community. They said, we're home. And I think it was such a lost opportunity. If Israel 
had the foresight and the ability to claim the West Bank and Gaza and say, you are now citizens of Israel, and we're going to treat you equally before the law. No one would have had to die. We would not be facing and looking at the genocide and the horrible things that we are now. But they would have had to give them citizenship. Aye, and why didn't they? Why couldn't they? Because they had the demographic fear. And this is really important. And this is an article that just recently I discovered. And it says, Israel faces historic decision as new population figures emerge. They tried to keep their Palestinian non-Jewish, I'm going to have to be real specific here with my words, population down to 20%. So if you have a Jewish democracy, well, the Jews are always going to win. But if you have it more free form, like we do in our country, well, you don't know. So they have the fear that if they had given them citizenship, well, then it would no longer be a Jewish democracy. It would be a democracy for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Well, in saying that, I'm a writer. I just gave the word Jewish a promotion just from an adjective. We know writers, you can delete adjectives, but you can't delete nouns so easily. A democracy for Jews and Muslims and Christians. Equality. And, you know, one thing I know as uh, I'm a retired teacher is, and I've met Palestinian teachers, I have a lot in common with them. People don't vote for somebody just because of their religion. I remember having this conversation uh, about four years ago when a lot of my uh, a lot of Jews were not supporting Bernie Sanders. They were they were more in favor of Hillary Clinton. I'm like, what? The first viable American Jewish presidential candidate, and you're going to support Hillary Clinton? So people vote for complex reasons, not just because of a religion. And but unfortunately the Israelis were unable to get over the demographic fear of being outnumbered by Palestinian non-Jews. And I uh, just want to invoke a few wise Jewish elders briefly. Uh, one's Amira Haas, who's uh, an Israeli journalist who wrote a book called Drinking the Sea at Gaza. And she writes for an Israeli newspaper called Haaretz. And in the intro to her book, Drinking the Sea at Gaza, she says, my mother told me she remembers the day she was put in a cattle car when the Germans were taking her and her family to a concentration camp. So Amira Haas says, my mother said to me, Never be a silent witness to human atrocities. And Amir Haas is one of the great journalists writing in Israel today. And then there's Avi Berg, who I actually met at one of the protests in Israel. I was like, he was standing next to me. It was like uh, standing next to a rock star. And Avi Berg, he was once speaker of Israel's Knesset from, from uh, 19... 19 1999 to 2003, and there was some people saying he was being groomed to become the prime minister, if only. And he said, the Jewish people did not survive two millennia in order to pioneer new weaponry, computer security programs, or anti-missile missiles. We were supposed to be a light among the nations. In this, we have failed. And then one more person I want to invoke, whose name I'm sure you know and you revere greatly, that's our friend Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein rejected Judaism and nationalism, but he understood the need for a sanctuary in Palestine. He believed in Hebrew University, which was founded in 1918, that it would be devoted to the pursuit of Jewish values of justice and human dignity. And this is his quote. 
If Jews cannot coexist peacefully with Arabs, we have learned absolutely nothing during our 2,000 years of suffering. The bond that has united the Jews for thousands of years and that unites them today is above all the democratic ideal of social justice coupled with the ideal of mutual aid and tolerance among all men. Albert Einstein, 1938. I'm just going to close here with a little bit of, I don't know if the word is hope, but a positive direction, a hopeful direction. And I have to say, I came fully armed today with my weapon of choice, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is a powerful pamphlet, which I just handed out to some kids in the lobby there. I hope that their parents take the time and read it. This is what makes me feel secure. This is what protects not only me as a Jew, but me as a human, and all of us as humans the rule of law as opposed to war and might makes right. I love this. And I'm not going, I'm going to skip all of the, um, all of the uh, UN resolutions, the right to return, the fourth Geneva Convention. Civilians have the right to be protected from murder, torture, or brutality. UN Resolution 242 calling for the in, inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force and the need for a just, just and lasting peace. UN Resolution 2334, saying that the Jewish settlements in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, were a violation of international law and had no legal validity. The most recent uh, statement uh, that the Palestinians gave to the International Crimin Criminal Court. This is what they're asking for. And I don't feel threatened by it. I embrace it. Makes me feel that would be a win-win for everybody. The state of Palestine appeals to this court to guide the international community in uh, upholding international law, ending injustice, and achieving a just and lasting peace to guide us towards a future in which Palestinian children are treated as children, not as a demographic threat. In which the identity of the group to which we belong does not diminish the human rights to which we are all entitled. A future in which no Palestinian and no Israeli is killed. A future in which two states live side by side in peace and security. The Palestinian people only demand respect for their rights. They ask for nothing more, and they cannot accept nothing less. The future of freedom, justice, and peace can begin here and now. And this is their most recent statement from the International Criminal Court. And I have here, I want to close. I just want to invoke my mother. My mother, God bless her, she just passed this year at 108 years old. My mother had the grace to welcome a Palestinian son-in-law into the family, much to her shock and at first horror. But she did. And she grew to love him, not only to love him, but his entire family. She became known as Mama Janet. I don't think there are too many Palestinians who have a Jewish Mama Janet in their family. And one day she turned to me, I think it was around the time of her 100th birthday, because she, she grew to love them. They were family. And she said, I don't understand why we just can't share the place. Share the place. And I said, Mom, you've become a radical. <laughs> and I'd like to close with a poem by Mahmoud Darwish, who is... The, so he's the most famous Palestinian poet, and he's known as the soul of Palestine. And that is a picture that I took off of uh, one of the walls in one of the refugee camps in the West Bank. And that's a picture of a refugee holding up his identity card. And you could see it says 1948, because that was the year he became a refugee, the year Israel's created. 
And this is uh, Mahmoud Darwish's poem. I belong there. I have many memories. I was born as everyone is born. I have a mother, a house with many windows, brothers, friends, and a prison cell with a chilly window. I have a wave snatched by seagulls, a panorama of my own. I have a saturated meadow in the deep horizon of my word. I have a moon, a bird's sustenance, and an immortal olive tree. I have lived on the land long before swords turned man into prey. Long before swords turned man into prey. I belong there. When heaven mourns for her mother, I return heaven to her mother. And I cry so loud that a returning cloud might carry my tears to break the rules. I have learned all the words needed for a trial by blood. I have learned and dismantled all the words in order to draw from them a single word, home. Thank you. So if there's any comments or questions or anything, we have, uh, I think we have a few minutes left. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. By the way, I am here with one of my dear, dear Palestinian friends, mm. Lamia Faruqi, <laughs> who drove with me here from Albuquerque. And we have been friends for decades. We were even, can't even remember when we met. It was so long ago. And we're friends. We just love each other. And that's just how it is. We will never be enemies. We're friends. <laughs> and thank you, Lamia, for coming here with me today. Well, thank you, yeah, and um, yeah, we have a little bit of time for questions, or yeah, if you would like. Um, does it, uh, yeah, Susan, here. Thank you so much. That was just very uh, enlightening. Um, I'm also from New York. I love your accent. Anyway, um, yeah. Um, I have a question because I was also raised on the books from the Holocaust, you know, Leon Uris and the whole group Exodus, Exodus. and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, so you mentioned that, you know, that was a myth that, you know, Palis well, that Palestinians said, you know, we don't want the state and everything. But yet, there are some hardened hearts on both sides, you know, that people who dig their feet in and say, we don't want you to exist from either side. How do you approach that as someone who lives in that area, having, you know, Palestinians who are, who are part of a group that would bomb someone and kill thousands of people, but then also having Israelis who will go in and raise lands and kill and displace people. How do you deal with that hardened, well, you're, you're right. There's been a lot of water under the bridge since 67. And like I said, that was a lost opportunity. But there are pockets of hope. And one of the stories in my book, if you read it, and I am selling some copies, there's the idea in the Middle East of a sulha. A sulha is like when two opposing sides come together and try to uh, find each other. Uh, what is it like? Not like remediation. A um, what's the word for that? Forgiveness. Yes, forgiveness. Well, a friend of mine who is Israeli Jew, she went to a sulha on her land. She came from a little town outside of Tel Aviv, and she faced. Uh, there was a, a whole group of Palestinian elders from a village where her community had been had built on their village. And I, I'll never forget the day she told me that story. She said, I can't imagine how you must feel having lost your village. I love it here. It's so beautiful. I am so sorry. 
I am so sorry. And she asked their forgiveness. And she said they cried. But the first step, the first step of any reconciliation is acknowledging what wrongs have happened and to say, I'm sorry, and to ask forgiveness. And the next steps in the sulha would be, well, where do you go from there? How do you recompense or, or, or for, the, for the wrongs that have done? Is it, do, you, do they get some land? Do they get some, I mean, that comes down the line. But the first step is to say, I'm sorry, I acknowledge the wrong I did. And I also want to say there's another group here that Lamia works with that is in New Mexico, and it's called Tomorrow's Women. And they every summer they bring uh, Palestinian and Israeli Jewish girls to New Mexico for an extended period of time to hear each other's stories. It is an amazing group, and Lamia could tell you more about it. It used to be called Creativity for Peace, some of you might know the name of that. Now it's called Tomorrow's Women. And because of the situation that's happened, this time they're going to bring, uh, instead of having a new crop of young women, they're going to bring some of the graduates of the program and to see how they've been processing all the horrors that have been going on. So those are two things. And one, one more thing, in Israel, there are these schools called hand-in-hand -hand schools. Of course, they're not sponsored by the government. They're privately funded. But in the hand-in-hand -hand schools, uh, the curriculum is what we would call in our state bilingual, bicultural. Mm -hmm. You have to learn Hebrew and Arabic, and you learn the narratives and histories of both people. Mm -hmm. And it's not an overnight quick fix, but it's the long range, and it's the way forward. And that's, those are some of the places where I find hope. And thank you for that question. I hope it answered. Yeah, the Tomorrow's Women, or when they were formerly known as Creativity for Peace, came here and did a talk. I don't know if you were here for that. or OK, yeah, yeah. So that'd be great to get more involved with them, too, here. Any other questions that we have? Yeah, yeah. Kelly. Hi, I'm really enjoying your book. I'm um, and um, I don't, I don't know. Tina might be announcing later. We're going to have a book group in March sometime to talk about um, the Unexpected Bride book. Um, but um, I wanted to ask more of a fun question: How did you get to New Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, I ended up, and that's the embroidery piece. That's oh. where that went. Uh, uh, Faisal, my uh, Palestinian husband, took me to his village called Samua. Now, Samua is outside of Hebron. And oh my God, I fell in love with that village. I loved it. It was very rural. They had animals, gardens. Everybody knew everybody. It was, it was a very integrated life. And I thought, you know, this is how I'd like to live. But in this village... Nobody spoke English, and they were all Palestinian, and I definitely was going to be going back home to New York and the States. But then I found, about, found out about the communes in New Mexico, <laughs> and I thought, maybe this is my village. And that's how I ended up in Taos, and that's how I ended up in the communes. And I fell in love with Taos, although I didn't stay in the communes, and I never left New Mexico. I just love New Mexico. Any other questions or comments? I would love a question from somebody who took issue with something I said or had a problem with it or because it's hmm. okay. Oh, Tyler. What I find myself wondering nowadays and particularly looking at those maps and thinking about 1940s, 50s, 60s, is um, if the international community, quote unquote, gives a bunch of Jewish people land in Palestine, and they're coming in as highly, highly traumatized people from centuries of 
brutality, especially in the 1940s. Was there some sort of obligation that everybody had to try to make sure that people who've been very traumatized and who are very on guard about being harmed again um, would somehow prosper um, with their neighbors um, in that in that very challenging situation. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, so we can look back at that now. But I guess I'm just wondering if you've given that some thought. Yeah. Well, I told you that I was the first one in my family to meet a Holocaust survivor uh, in my family, Cousin Meyer. And what's interesting is my aunt and my mother's sister and my grandmother and my mother had been sending him money since he arrived in Israel, helping to support him, which really shocked me because I would have thought Israel really took good care of Holocaust survivors which was not the case. Not all the Holocaust survivors were well taken care of. Um, and you know, you're right. The Holocaust survivors, in my opinion, they deserved to go anywhere in the world they wanted to and should have been given the wherewithal to get there and to start a new life. And in truth, if most of them really wanted to come to this country, to the United States, but they should have been given the choice. And within Palestine, Israel, which is what I call it, they could have been given the wherewithal to move there and live there and been supported without creating a national entity, which, in my opinion, has been very problematic and not necessarily a Jewish sanctuary. They could have created the Jewish sanctuary. And there were wise Jewish elders like uh, Judah Magnus, who was one of the founders of Hebrew University, who wanted Israel to be created as a binational state for all the people from the get-go. You cannot move to a place that already has an indigenous population there and just not want to live as neighbors, but you want to supplant them. There's a difference in intention of moving to Palestine and wanting to live uh, as neighbors with the people who live there or wanting to supplant them and get rid of them and take over the place. There's a big difference, and it would have been wonderful had they really had the intention of creating a Jewish sanctuary in Palestine. And yes, the Holocaust survivors should have given a choice and the... And the the funds to go anywhere they wanted. And you know, there's a, a rabbi, Rabbi Michael Lerner, he said the Jews left the ovens of Auschwitz and jumped onto the backs of the Palestinians. Yes, they were traumatized. Yes, they were. And I too grew up reading the book Exodus, by the way. I even changed my name for a time to Karen Trotsky, that's my alter ego mm -hmm. name, in honor of one of the characters in that book who uh, survived the Holocaust only to be killed on a kibbutz. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being here. We can give her a big thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll be in the back if anybody wants books or yes. signing books. Yeah, so she'll be uh, selling books and signing books. So, um, And just thank you for sharing your stories. And as we know, stories are very important to share with each other. And as you're doing with Tomorrow's Women, is that what it's called now? Okay, Tomorrow's Women, yeah. And just how that can transform relationships and build bridges, right? Um, so I thank you. I just want to say one more thing real quick. Make Palestine your Valentine. Donate money to UNRWA. This organization is a humanitarian organization that has been taking care of the Palestinian people since 1948. And our country has just defunded uh, this wonderful organization that really deserves funding. And it's, if they aren't funded and if they're forced to close their doors, it's going to cause more horrific yeah. hardships for all the people in the West Bank and in Gaza. 
So on my, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave you with this. Oh, great. So yeah, thank you. Me. And then did you want to mention the Jonathan Kutub's, uh book as well uh, yeah. for something to read that's really yeah. and enlightening that's, that's where that's where we met for the second yeah time. for the second time because uh jonathan katub came and spoke uh in albuquerque and this is a beautiful read and this is also a very positive solution beyond the two state solution and it's free online too so you can download the pdf and it's free mm -hmm. he, he, they want people to read it so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iris. <laughs>